and Levon already reminded us that there have been many women uh, as part of the movement against apartheid, and uh, Mandy Sanger is one of them. She's with us today. She's been working at the District 6 Museum. Maybe we can change the presentation um, for 13 years. Before saying more about Mandy, I would like to um, read a short passage from what Ron King wrote 12 years ago, um, a few days before the start of the conference, the uh, New Tactics in Human Rights Conference held in Ankara, which is the first time that Tur the Turkish audience came to learn about the District 6 Museum. This will be in Turkish. of July 2004, this is what Kuranting wrote in Birgün. We had to accept that sometimes we come to a bottleneck, especially when it comes to human rights violations. Yes, we have more sensitivity with regards to human rights violations, but when it comes to how we can prevent abuse or violations of rights, we have a bottleneck. We are tired of doing the same thing and saying the same thing again and again. We're trying to express ourselves, but we're not able to raise our voice well. And this shows, uh, in a way, uh, that the violation of human rights that is perpetrated is accepted. What can we do so that our voice can be heard? What can we do so that we have the marketing skills of advertising companies uh, so that we will be attracting the attention of the uh, people. And maybe we shall establish a human rights marketing agency. So in the international symposium to be organized in Ankara, we will have participants from international NGOs, academics, who will be sharing their experience with each other. So he goes on to give some information about the conference. So actually the questions he asked at that time are still the questions that we are asking. And even in those days we were inspired by certain examples and we are continuing to listen to these examples as well. Nobody could have guessed that Hurramping Foundation will be established after all these years and Nayant will be visiting Constitutional Hill and the District 6 Museum and bring the founders of these uh, sites to Turkey here. Hiram Pink wouldn't ha couldn't have known this, of course, when he was writing these words, but thanks to the windows he opened for us, we are discovering new friends and learning a lot from them. I will continue in English. Um, Mandy Sanger who will be talking about the District 6 Museum and the pedagogy of memorialization. She is the head of education at the District 6 Museum with a special but some exclusive focus on youth and community participation in the life of the museum through intergenerational creative and educational encounters within a critical pedagogy framework. She is particularly interested in the continuities and discontinuities reflected in the exercise of power from the past into the present, with an emphasis on illuminating possibilities for an egalitarian future that respects freedom, democratic citizenship, and social justice. Mandy has worked at the District 6 Museum for the past 13 years and has participated in its public programs before as a high school teacher. So she has a long history uh, with the museum. She was a student community activist in the 70s and 80s, uh, 80s and a unionist at the height of the mass movement against apartheid in the 1990s, where her role uh, was always uh, about public participation, where art and culture are important vehicles for deepening critical thought and creative practice, as she calls it. Her main role is that of a facilitator and mediator of learning in different contexts, um, and facilitated workshops on this and related matters. In partnership with a number of community-based organizations, she facilitates learning journeys that build resilience and solidarity across barriers of race, gender, sexuality, age, geography, ability, power, and privilege where possible. So we have a lot to learn from her. 
Currently, her work involves designing programs related to memory, race, and racism with a practice component that, re that involves reimagining the city. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, well, uh, thanks to the Rand Kent Foundation for uh, inviting me. Uh, as has been said, it's a real privilege uh, to be with, uh, in the company of people who have been presenting here today as well. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to show you buildings. We are very different museum. We, we occupy space, uh, particularly, <laughs> particularly spaces uh, in the history of South Africa that we were not allowed to be in because we were not white. Um, and uh, so I'm going to go through how we work with memory and for us, uh, redefining the whole notion of a museum as not something that is in a building. Uh, so, so we are site of conscience, uh, and we do a lot of work on that site. But just by way of um, contextualizing, I know people are very familiar with apartheid, but there isn't just one story of apartheid. Uh, there are many different experiences of apartheid. Unfortunately, when it comes to political victories, the victors often write the history in their image. <laughs> and so a lot gets lost in the process of the writing of history. And so we, we look at the history of apartheid from a very different vantage point uh, to those who are now in power. It's a very different kind of uh, approach. So the first key question is why memorialize in the first time? Why don't we just move on? Why don't we just make sure that society is equal for everyone? Um, and then a very important sub-question that, that I'm attempt to answer is, what should the nature of memory work be? Memory work is not innocent. It's, uh, memory is very fragile. People remember what they want to. Um, um, memory is often in the image of those who have power. Uh, we've got the money to make their memories the memories of everyone else. So memory is, is uh, problematic. Uh, it's not an innocent practice. And then also memory is very malleable. People with power can shape it in their interests um, and they can use it uh, to foster new conflicts in society. And so um, a key we ask ourselves at the District Museum is, in whose interest do we excavate the fragments of the six uh, memory? Um, and that question is very important for us. In, in our case, we, we take a very strong political stand. And for us, political isn't politics as in government politics. It's the politics of the everyday. And our strong political stand is that we act in the interests of those who are dispossessed, who are marginalized, who are the weakest and the most vulnerable in society. So our work does have a, a political purpose. Um, a, a, a very important contextual point is that often South Africa is seen as very unique in the world. But I want to contextualize the work we're doing in relation to British colonialism and Dutch colonialism. And the very interesting article by two Irish academics, Bill Ralston and I forget the first name of, of McVeigh. And they write in an article called Civilizing the Irish that at the heart of this account is a bigger question. What is the connection between civilization and colonialism? What to do with the natives if they are not to be exterminated? If genocide is out of the question, for either moral or practical reasons, how are the natives to be made fit for the purpose of being colonial subjects? A civilizing process involves first the transformation of resisting natives into unresisting subjects, and then the recruitment as actively co-opted citizens. In South Africa, we had a system of racism that didn't involve genocide. Uh, so the, 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 the people of South Africa weren't killed off in some kind of mass extermination program. But that doesn't mean that the trauma 
species any less. The act of civilizing the natives involves a lot of dehumanizing of the people of South Africa, but Africa as well. Um, in civilizing the natives, they created the system of apartheid really inspired by Hitler. Uh, it was an organized system of racism. All the cities in South Africa were reconfigured along racial lines. And now, important to understand that this happened in a very quick historical period. So all these racial identities were microwaved. These right racialized identities didn't come and develop organically over centuries. So the idea of race or ethnicity in South Africa is not something like the case with Turkish identity or, or Armenian identity, etc. Here you had in the 30s, 40s, and then particularly in the 1950s, a case of forcefully making sure that every South African belongs to some kind of race based on things like skin color, hair texture, nose. So it was the practice of eugenics that Hitler perfected by measuring people's physical looks and then putting them into a particular race identity. But this happened in a very short time. And why it was traumatic is that in a place like Cape Town, people were mixing over centuries. And so it was easy to divide the very dark-skinned people and the very fair-skinned people. But in most families, people were were mixed. So most families in the place that I come from, like Cape Town, have very dark brothers and very fair brothers or sisters in the same family. That's a wonder of genetics. And so now a birthday comes and there's this whole segregation, sorting of people into different race groups, and it's extremely traumatic. Families get split up. Um, uh, everything from the cradle to the grave is determined by what race group you belong to. Right? What they also do is they have a myriad of laws that then control where you go to school, where you go to church, what beaches you can go to, who you can marry. And so this is extremely traumatic for people. Um, but very important, the one point that I think we need to understand, that this system of apartheid was really to enable the very quick extraction of wealth out of the country. It, 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 what capitalism was built on. So South African capitalism was built on uh, segregation and racialization, divide and rule, basically. So I'm going to go forward because I think people know a lot about apartheid. So I'm not going to go through the details of apartheid. I'm going to fast forward um, to the story of District 6. District 6 is basically in that section. That's the famous Table Mountain. It's one of the seven wonders of the world now. Um, and it's a huge, it's a long mountain range that runs along the peninsula that is Cape Town. That entire mountain was declared for white people only. Right? So all along the foot of the mountain, there are about 42 places that were declared white. So if you were not classified as white, you were then forcibly removed, right? And District 6 over there is one of the places that still remains empty. That's a, a kind of map of District 6. That's the streets of District 6. Those streets do not exist anymore. Fragments of those streets exist. They were bulldozed. So people's homes were bulldozed. They were racially classified, separated to the Cape Flats. This is the basis of South African cities today. So it's an English model. So you'll find this kind of housing in Ireland. You'll find it in a lot of the colonies of England. They're basically dormitory towns created to house workers who then have to travel into the city or to the farms or to the mines to go and work. So it's a model of a, of a city which is incredibly unhealthy. 
the majority of people in South Africa live in places like these in township. And these are the people whose memories we work with. The key role of the District 6 Museum is to reconnect people who are living in these dormitory towns to the sites that their parents were for, or their grandparents were forcibly removed from. Right? This is a typical township in South Africa. You can see it's like a labor reserve. Right? It's not designed for healthy life. Um, but very important to the work of the museum is, you can see with that situation alone, um, we can mobilize anger. You know, if I want to activate people and really get their anger, that's where I stop and say, this is what white people did to us. Let's mobilize and get what was taken away from us back. It's a very easy, very powerful, very volatile kind of situation that you can. But for us, it's very important to, to realize that we must break the cycle of violence. We must break the cycle of repetitive victim perpetrator, where victims become perpetrator by justifying the perpetration through their suffering in their past. And so very important, the work we do, why invoke memory? Um, for us, as the Statistics Museum, memory work is not neutral, and we do not want to sustain conflicts. We want people to learn from that history and then think about how do we create healthy society? How do we create equality? Right? And then just in terms of the truth narrative, we do not work with grand narratives of truth or the facts of history. We do not work with the idea of victims, perpetrators, bystanders. We question that. Um, we, we, we don't work with narratives that promote a hierarchy of victimhood. So, six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust, 12 million uh, um, people killed in the Holocaust, uh, 20 million slaves killed, you know, so you create a hierarchy based on how big the trauma or the massacre was. We question that whole way of looking at, at trauma. Um, then just before I go and show you some images of, of how we work, um, the way we do work is we construct, reconstruct memory from the fragments. So, uh, most of our work is oral history. So our entire museum is in the voice of the people who are actually for forcibly removed. Um, uh, it's not the voice of the expert or the professor. The museum was created by intellectual activists, artists, but most people who were forcibly removed. Making the museum and all our activities, it's a deeply participatory process. So people and participation comes before a perfect exhibition. That comes before we value the participatory process far more. Um, and then finally, we construct narratives collectively but it's for the purpose of, of illuminating issues of social justice. So we, a lot of our memory work is in the present. We don't reenact the past, right? We work in the present. So we dig deeper, but importantly, we dig wider. And by digging wider, it means that lots of other cases of human rights violation resonate with us. We establish links. Um, just a quotation from one of the famous writers that emerged from this district, Richard Reeve, and he was murdered um, uh, um, in the 90s um, uh, as an act of crime. Uh, he wrote a book called Buckingham Palace, and you can see by the name, it's kind of glorious. And one of the things he said was, I want to help restore a sense of history to people, people who have long been buffeted by hostile laws, and made exiles from the homes of their choice because of eviction under the Brutalist Act. 
And so that really defines the purpose of the museum. We don't just want people to come back and reclaim their land. It's important that people reclaim dignity that was lost. People were dehumanized by apartheid. That's the sites of memory in District 6 that we work with. So we've done a lot of research through oral history testimony, through reading various uh, literature, literature and manuscripts, and we've managed to come up with about 60 sites in District 6 that no longer exist, but that were very important. They the cinemas that used to be there, the places where people used to learn to dance, the places where people bought things, like restaurants that were destroyed, the mosques, the churches, the synagogues. Uh, District 6 was very cosmopolitan. It was very mixed in, in many senses. So this is a list of the sites that we work with that no longer is there anymore, right? This is basically what District 6 brings me to do to rubble. And so a key part of our work is how do you work with memory, the memory of absence almost, right? And so the way we have to do it is we do a lot of public participation, rituals, performance, in situ, where a certain important site was, which was Worsley Street, right? Lots of work memory. You can see what this street used to look like before. And uh, we do lots of memory walks with people who come to that site. And uh, this is a key. So our museum is outside. We do a lot of these walks with school kids, with international visitors, but most importantly with the people who came from that site. Right? Um, this is a typical example. It looks a bit like the Warsaw Ghetto. <laughs> um, and a lot of our work Yeah. So a lot of our work is about taking the archive and linking it to these empty sites. So a lot of the, it's about locating the history of people that have, have been erased and locating it in the actual sites. We, right, we do a lot of outdoor exhibitions that's co-curated. Um, this is very similar to what they do in South America where there were detention centers or where people have disappeared and they put them in the places where they disappeared from. Right, these are just examples of fragments. Very importantly, this is some of the mosques and the churches were left. Right? And this is what we work with now. The yellow arrows are that where they built a, a university for white people only, over some of the main sites of District 6 and um, the, the, as an apartheid institution. And so, although we, as a museum, work with this empty site, um, it's contested, right? So, a typical example, we do rituals with people like that, building cans of stone stones where important things happen, and it's a deeply political act. We mark sites. So this is a, a university residence over the last remaining remnant of a very important street in District 6 called Grand Hanover Street, and we take images from the archive and we mark the site. Right? We do this with great opposition. Right? This is the museum. I'm not showing you the building, but the museum is designed like a memory box. So it's got layers and layers. In fact, we went to visit the Museum of Innocence today. And the Museum of Innocence is, in some ways, uh, it, it uses the same approach we use, that the intimate personal stories resonate more powerfully with people from lots of different cultures, lots of different languages, um, and it's like a memory box. So the museum is gathering layers and layers. We didn't have a master plan. Uh, the museum is in a church, old church building, 
And that church building used to be a site where activists used to gather to protest against apartheid. And people used to protest and then bring photographs. And there was meant to be an exhibition up for two weeks for streets. And it just never came down. It just gathered layers and layers. And that is what is now the museum. So it still continues to gather layers. Um, a key aspect of the museum is people coming to the museum. There are lots of spaces created for people to inscribe themselves and their own stories into the museum. And people often argue with each other. So on the right you find the memory clock. And here we had a visitor from Palestine. And the visitor from Palestine writes, in Palestine, we are still under occupation. We are hoping to get to the out of it very soon and be liberated like you. And then in pencil, you can't read very clearly. But somebody who sympathizes with Israel comes into the museum and writes, this is false. And then talks about, we shall return to Israel. Now, we don't go and sanitize that. We want the museum to have those conversations, those difficult dialogues, right? Um, uh, a lot of artists work with, work with the museum, and they've taken things from people's oral histories and interpreted it visually. This is a mural, part of a mural that's in the museum, uh, sorry, in the museum, and it, it references other sites of forced removal in South Africa, which is very important. Um, now, this is really like the Museum of Innocence. This is a project that we're currently involved in. It's the creation of very intimate, personal stories that's going to result in a huge exhibition in lots of different sites in Cape Town. It's called our Suitcase Project. So it's about working, young people, working with older people who lived during apartheid. And it's based on the idea that an archive isn't something that's locked up in some room somewhere at a university or at a museum. Every living human being is a walking archive. We have photo albums. We've got objects at home. So the idea is for the young person and the older person to construct a mini exhibition in a suitcase that tells the story of a whole range of individuals about a person. And then I'm just going to show you some images of how we engage. So um, the, we don't have what is called an outreach program, right? We don't, because people are involved in the museum all the time. So it's not something we occasionally do or we market. So people are coming to the museum. Here you have young people sharing the stories of the older people who were forcibly removed. Right? Um, and very powerful. It's, it's something that happens almost every day. Here we have young people who come and... So we don't, unlike Constitution Hill, we don't do curriculum work. But we provide the space for schools and teachers to come and do projects on apartheid, on human rights on racism, which is very important in the city. And so here we have an example. We do have a lot of performing identity, revealing the stories of place. I'll just show you some images. Um, right, we, we reenact the way people in District 6 created community around food. And that it's not the buildings that was destroyed only that matter. It's the culture and the way in which people create this community. And so we do a lot of those kinds of uh, work. Very importantly, we recognize that we're memorializing in the company of new forms of displacement. So as we memorialize in the past, we're doing it in a world where there's new conflict and war happening. You have apartheid in lots of parts of the world, right? You have apartheid in places like Indonesia, you have apartheid in places like uh, Israel, Palestine. You have apartheid in, other, in lots of places where people are segregated based on their identity. 
um, gentrification is displacing thousands and thousands of people, inequality, and then violent crime, whether it be through gangsters or political thugs. Um, one of the key projects we do is with young people, as so we have a, a massive program where young people curate exhibitions. This is a particular um, uh, exhibition curated by a group of young people in an organization we partner with called the Institution, Institution for Healing of Memories. And they've taken on the theme of religion, which is becoming a major source of mobilizing for conflict in Africa. But people who have been living for, together for generations are suddenly fighting with each other. And so this is an exhibition curated by these young people based on lots of oral histories called God Has Many Names. And I have to include atheism in that as well. <laughs> but the whole idea is get to get young people to say, it's okay for people to worship differently. They can still occupy the same space. And so that's uh, key. And then we have a massive project where we make the archive live. So it's about taking the archive into the sites we occupy. And so this is a group of young people working on a project called Art in Public Places. And so they've worked with a lot of the people in our archive, and they've enlarged them, and they put them in the spaces that people... Uh, we do a lot of these public photographic booths where we invite people who are forcibly removed, in this case from what was called the Jewish Quarter in District 6. We invite them back there and they get photographed as part of creating an, our archive. So our archive isn't just something from the past. We're constantly creating it. We have a humanizing pedagogy, very importantly. People were destroyed. They weren't allowed to mix with each other. They look at each other as enemies. So our space, this is our homecoming center, and we invite young people in. This is a program called A Night at the Museum, where diverse group of young people spend the entire night. So the first night, they, in apartheid, they divided racially. They wake up in democracy, and they have to shape democracy. So they have to develop community projects in some way. Because one of the very important things for us is it's not enough for people to know history. What are they going to do about it? How are they going to use that knowledge to reshape the future? And that's a very key point. And then just this just shows some of the activities they engage in. Right? We do a lot of intergenerational work, lots of intergenerational, where there are layers of generation. Not just old and young, but your 90-year-old share with your 40, 50-year-old, your 40, 50-year-old share with your high school students, your high school students share with your primary school students. Okay, these are just some activities I'll go through, and then I'll conclude. Um, a lot of our site marking is ephemeral, so we don't put statues to mark the weather takes it away, or thieves steal it. <laughs> so it's not meant to permanently mark sites. But that's an iconic seven steps that was bulldozed, that was a place of gathering for gangsters, as well as intellectuals and people who were in the underground. They used to meet there, too. And so it was quite an important. Um, right, these are just some of our intergenerational work. Older people learning modern tools of creating murals to, to mark sites. Um, I just want to end by something that we, 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 we engage in with um, a lot of our high school uh, students. And it's, um, it's, it's from a book called Teacher and Child. It's by psychologist Heim. I'm do not. Um, and it's very important that the, although it's about the Holocaust, the, the important thing is about the pedagogy of memory that we relate to. And it says, I'm a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no person should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers, children poisoned by educated physicians, infants killed by trained nurses, 
Women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. So I'm suspicious of education. My request is help your students become human. Your effort must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated Eichmann. Reading, writing, arithmetic are important only if they serve to make our children more human. And that really is what, what shapes us. Right? And I'll end it with that. Thank you.